months, the first death of India was reported. And uh, uh, that's how the timeline span. We started getting more and more number of cases. It spread from Kerala to Maharashtra, from Delhi, and then finally from Jammu to Kanyakumari. It was all across the country. We had the first peak. Then came the, uh, uh, in May of around 19th or 20th, we reported 100,000 cases a day. That was huge. Then arose what we call as the second wave. And the second wave uh, actually was first reported in May, 31st of May, 2021. And uh, it, is, it continued to spread till September, October, November, all across the globe. It caused havoc across, right from Italy to America, to my fellows in Australia. And it was a terrorist almost like an attack of terrorism in India, where hundreds of thousands and millions of people got tortured and several of them died and our condolences to all of them. Now, what happened? Unfortunately, this, uh, uh, this new variant called the Delta variant started uh, behaving different from the first wave, from the Alpha, Beta, Gamma. And this was called a variant, a variant of concern. So there are variant of interest. That means there have been several other variants in the past, which have just caused interest to the epidemiologists, to the virologists. And variants of concerns have called widespread diseases. And that's how this second wave started. Unfortunately, this wave uh, had uh, loads of infections, hospitalizations, and death. And this is terrible. This is like terrible. Besides the healthcare coming under pressure, the economic outcome, because I know many, most of the people are non-medical, also took a, a different outlook for the decade. And my economist friends actually muted this outlook from the so-called uh, champagne soaked to room temperature, saying that this virus is going to ca cause havoc and the economic outcome is also going to be poor. Let me tell you, this is not the first uh, case or the first pandemic that humanity ever saw. We've seen, we've seen hundreds of uh, pandemics, especially last four over the last hundred years. And how is this different from them? In, in this pandemic, we are better prepared because we have better technology. We had vaccination that was quickest and ever fastest in the world compared to the other ones. The Spanish flu, almost 20 to 30% of the population died in some countries. We were not so bad. However, large number of people died. What was different between the first, second and third? I will tell you in a minute, the third wave. The third wave, the latest one is the Omicron wave. It's actually the 15th letter of the Greek alphabet. Uh, predictably, uh, you know, uh, there should have been another letter or another name to this wave, but for G would be the name or new would be the name for better reasons and for connotations for the Chinese leader. This was skipped and Omicron was given. This was first discovered on 26th of November, 2021 because of the expertise of the South African scientists in Botswana. And this was found to be very, very infectious. So the R0 value, what we talk medically, is when one person can infect how many other people? This is almost 50 to 70 times more infectious compared to the Delta. And we all remember Delta, the horror stories of Delta. So this is very, very infectious. What's different between the first, second, and third? In the first wave, we were not prepared. We didn't have treatment. We don't know how this virus would behave. Second wave, we had better equipments, we had better drugs to treat our patients with, but this is a very, very virulent strain. It was infectious, two and three times more than the alpha, beta, gamma, but it was more deadly, more virulent, more people died, more people ended up in ICU and hospital compared to the Omicron. The Omicron, the current wave that you are in, typically affects the upper respiratory tract. It causes cough, fever, sore throat, and body ache. It by and large does not penetrate the lungs. So you don't get more number of patients getting lung involvement, going to the ICU. But let me tell you, my words are very cautious. I say you do not get by and large. It does not mean we've had patients who've come into the ICU and on the ventilator, presumably because of the Omicron. So we need to keep our guards on. It's certainly not uh, as, in, as ferocious as the second one, the Delta one. Why is this less ferocious? Is it because there is a change in the mutation? Yes, one, of course, the change in the mutation. But let me tell you, there are 50 mutations on this spike protein of the Omicron compared to seven and eight from the previous alpha, beta, gamma. That means it can change its behavior over a period of time. But what's historically proven most beneficial has been the vaccination. The vaccination drive across the globe 
particularly in India, where we vaccinated more than 157 crore people, almost 65% of our country is doubly vaccinated. And that's 49% that's, uh, uh, of our country is doubly vaccinated, 65% singly vaccinated. And those numbers may, so, uh, may sound small, but that's the largest single number of uh, people getting double vaccination. Worldwide, there's only been 50% of people who've been vaccinated, double vaccinated. So we are right there a country with an average GDP spending of less than 1% on healthcare, massively populated and poor infrastructure by and large, but great going by the government, spreading the awareness of vaccination, reaching vaccination to smaller states and towns and villages and making sure people have got vaccinated has been the foremost donor to prevent us from getting a severe disease. How will this turn out to be? I'm sure Dr. Sunil will want to know that or want to ask me that. But I think this wave has been very, very quick. There's been a sharp upturn, uprise. And I would say Mumbai is almost peaking out at this moment. The rest of the country will start peaking in the next two and three weeks. And I expect this down wave to be equally sharp. It may not be as prolonged as the Delta wave or the second wave of September 2021. With this, we are in a wave, we must keep our behavior appropriate. I urge all vaccine skeptics, all the citizens to go ahead, take the vaccine shots if they've not taken it, take the third shot or so-called the government calls it the precautionary shot so that you are better prepared to fight this virus if you were to get it. Don't be a skeptic to say that the virus is more harmful. It has now been beyond doubt that the vaccine is much more protective than any other thing and continue to have your Covidian appropriate behavior, which is putting your mask up in the correct position, trying to keep a physical distance and washing your hands. This virus is here to stay. If I start from December 31st, 2019, and if you were to give me a date when it's going to end, I'm no pundit, but I think this date has an infinity date. This virus is going to be here for our lifetimes. Dr. Sunil, I think we can proceed to the next ones so that there are more questions and answers. Thank you. Thank you, Prateet. Very, very lovely overview of the whole situation. Uh, Dr. Deepak, I'm going to come to you. Uh, what is in Bom Mumbai, what is the situation in the hospitals now? Do we now need that oxygen preparation which was there for Delta? Has Delta disappeared completely? And I'm going to ask you a very prevalent question. Has our section, I know in Mumbai, we have two complete different uh, population se se sections. One in the slums and one in the buildings. So my direct question to you is, has both the sections of this population now reached herd immunity? And are we ever going to reach herd immunity? So Dr. Deepak, can you answer these four or five questions for me and any other points you may want to put up? Yeah. First thing about uh, your first question. Uh, can you repeat the first question? So, I'll, uh, so my first right. question is, how is the hospitalized situation yeah, situation yeah. in Mumbai at present? Yeah. How many Done. Delta are there? No, so how many Delta so, patients are there? One, one at a time, Sunil. I'll miss it yeah. out again. So in yeah. that, as a direct question, right, how many Delta patients are admitted? How many non-vaccinated are admitted? And how many Omicron are admitted? Let me start with what uh, Dr. Pratik left behind. When we started in the first phase, when we were involved with the government and we were trying to help out and we were seeing how to uh, things, I'll just add to the history. One, we did not know what is going to happen that time. We did not have any knowledge of the disease. Second phase, there, so there were multiple admissions and multiple deaths. Deaths were in front of us, people going to the bathroom, just collapsing and dying. We were absolutely without any knowledge and know-how of how to treat this particular disease. In the second phase, Delta, we were better prepared as far as the medication is concerned, but we were not prepared as far as the infectivity of Delta was concerned. Delta was a serious disease. Patients came on ventilator, there was a severe stress on uh, bed as well as oxygen and even the resources of medicine was severely constrained. In the third phase, we were prepared with medicine, bed, everything. But luckily, the third phase has not left us with any severe morbidity or like kind of a disease status. What we call this third stage just now is more of a COVID flu. Some people don't, may not like to call it, but I would say that because the majority of the patients are like COVID flu like a common flu. Now, when uh, Sunil, you asked the question whether it has affected the bed, 
Initially, the government said that if the COVID status reaches beyond 20,000 cases per day in Bombay, we will have a lockdown. We realized that no, number of cases are not getting admitted. So it is not the number of cases which were important. It is the number of beds which were being filled up, the resources which were being constrained, the oxygen which were being re uh, reduced, the number of uh, requirement of oxygen were increasing. Only then we started thinking that we will have a lockdown. Only the health structure was going to be affected. And that is the situation of today. Today, we have N number of cases coming in. In fact, what we have postulated is the number of cases will go beyond per day cases as more than the Delta wave across the globe. Even in US, we are seeing more than 6 lakh of cases plus per day. Even UK and other cases also, as uh, Dr. Sa will tell you about UK, many, even in South Africa, number of cases are going to increase. As rightly said, that it is a very severely infected disease. Like, you know, if the transmission is huge, everyone is going to get it. One person in the family gets it, everyone's going to get it. Then what are we worried about? If it's just a simple flu and everyone's going to get it, what are we worried about? Luckily, admissions are less, but there are a few admissions. Like if 100 people earlier were getting infected and say 10% of the people were getting admitted, today there are 1,000 people getting ad uh, infected and there are 1% people getting admitted. The number of patients admitted may be the sim similar, but luckily it has come to lesser than that. The number of cases in the ICU are less. The number of patients in the wards are also less. Then who are getting admitted? And whom are we admitting today? I'll just few pointers so that you all are fully aware of whom to admit and who do not require admission. First point is elderly people and even with comorbidity or blood pressure diabetes need not be admitted. Who definitely require admission are the ones, one, whose fever is beyond four days, high grade, whose oxygen saturation is less than 94, those who are having some severe diseases like HIV transplant, who are on renal, trans, uh, renal dialysis, who are just approaching their delivery status of two weeks. These are the people who require definite admission because they're immunocompromised and they may require, definitely they may go uh, serious or something. They may go into complications. It is also seen that in the family where everyone has got uh, infected and we assume it is Omicron, one particular patient may turn out to be going critical. Then how do we explain this? We are postulating that Omicron may, when it affects the lungs, may be involved with Delta also. When Omicron and Delta come together, we are calling it Delta Omicron. So these type of patients with lung involvement, we are saying is a Delta variant, which is coexisting with Omicron if the entire family is affected. In these patients with saturation low, high grade fever more than four days, we are finding lung involvement. These patients may require admission. And so these are the requirements and the number of these cases are quite less, Sunil. And hence so, the number so of... Super, one, one, very, one very quick question again, just to make it very simple for our people here. The bottom line is, if you have fever more than four days, please do not ignore it. It may be high grade or low grade. If you have fever for more than four days, it could be a combined attack of both Omicron and Delta. And please approach the doctor and look at it as an option of admission. And such patients should also be monitoring their uh, 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 oxygen saturation. Is that right? So anybody, okay. uh, a live marker for everybody here is, if your fever is more than four days, you can get it. Now, my other question to you, Deepak, is this. If you now, suppose my whole family gets Omicron today, then for how long am I safe from not getting this infection again? Or should I then become Superman, remove my mask and start dancing on the road and say, oh, now I'm done with this thing. And now I can now be free. Is that oh, is that a misnomer or is that true? See, there are two, three aspects to this. First point is, a person with Omicron, we still don't know for how many days he may shed the virus. We have postulated that uh, isolation period is for seven days and he should not be shedding it outside. But it's not the case. A patient of Omicron positive may shed the virus for up to two months or more also. So it is not that the isolation period is an indicator of infectivity. We are reducing his isolation period, but that does not mean that he does not wear a mask. The patient of Omicron may still infect the others even after seven days of isolation period. And hence, the mask doesn't go. Till everyone, as you rightly said about herd immunity now, well, let's go into that. Herd immunity, we say when more than 70% of the population is infected. India has got a huge population and we don't expect herd immunity to come too soon. There may be areas, pockets, like Bombay and all, 
which has got good vaccination drive and people are infected faster, where herd immunity may come up faster. We may follow the South Indian model, South African model, where there'll be a huge peak and it'll come down as equally fast. And we are seeing that now and hopefully it should come down. But herd immunity is something which we definitely hope for. And that is one thing which will actually help us also because vaccination, how much ever you try, like the government is sincerely taking its severe efforts. But herd immunity actually helps. And we always said this, go get yourself infected. Even doctors, we tell ourselves, I hope you all get infected with Omicron. Because Omicron, we say that in fact, any disease gets immunity for at least three months to us. It doesn't mean we do not share it to others, but the immunity remains for us. So if we are not, if we are removing the mask or something like that, it's not that we can remove the mask. We may not get infected, but we may still infect others if it is there in our nasal secretions. That is the reason we, Sunil, we do not remove the mask. So if somebody has got Delta, can he get Omicron? And if somebody has got Omicron, can he get Delta? Absolutely. In fact, so, we have seen that patients who are people who are vaccinated got Delta also. And people who are vaccinated and got Delta have still got Omicron also. So the mutations definitely are such. In fact, what we postulate is that in due course of time, if the fourth wave comes, it will be a new variant. It will be a new strain. So whatever strain has come and gone, we don't expect that same strain to cause the fourth or the fifth wave usually. But we expect that any new strain, like for example, the second wave was Delta. It was a new strain. The third wave is Omicron, which is a new strain. And God forbid, if a fourth wave come, it will be a new strain. Thank you, Deepak. That, that was very, very pertinent and particular uh, uh, information. Now, one last thing to both Deepak and Pratit. I true tr strongly know and I believe that technically at present for Omicron, we don't have the treatment in India. Am I right? In quick, uh, one of you both, either both can answer it. There is no specific uh, antibody cocktail or medication or anything available which is directly effective against Omicron, which is available in the US right now. Am I right when I say that? So, uh, okay, Dr. Deepak, you want to go ahead? Oh, no, you go ahead first. Okay. So, well, the antivirals that are available, one the oral and the injectable, have not shown that they will not work against home, they will not work against Omicron. The very fact that Omicron is a milder disease, it literally means you don't need any specific treatment. You need only supportive treatment. That's point number one. You spoke about monoclonal antibodies. You know, the Roche literature, the manufacturer of the monoclonal antibody, Castorimumab and Indevimab, which Trump took in September 2020, categorically writes they're drawing the initial specimens or period of studies in a small number of people. This antibody cocktail has shown to be less effective against some strains of the Omicron. What does that mean? It does not say it's not effective. It does not say it's not effective against all the strains. So I would feel that until we get more data, Whatever is available, if you have a high-risk high patient, I think we should offer him the best that's available. Thank you very much. So now... Yeah. now I'll add to that. Uh, sorry, I'll add to that. See, the question is not what medicine is effective. The question is, should we treat? Do we require treatment? So the first issue is, if it's Omicron, we do not require treatment because it is restricted to uh, areas like the upper respiratory tract infection, and it doesn't affect the lungs. If we say it doesn't affect the lungs, we do not require treatment, whether it's monoclonal antibodies or anything. In order to say that you require treatment, you need to have some criteria fulfilled. You need to have fever more than four days. You need to have saturation less than 94. You need to possibly have a lung involvement. You need to be in the high category risk group, that HIV or something which is immunocompromised. In those cases, we need to give monoclonal antibodies, or we need to give severe, or we need to give any other medicine which is required, which is and possibly... That might, that might also, again, not... Again, so that might also come into a mixed infection of Delta and Omicron. So please note, What's people, a, a, a take-home message here is that the most critical part in this wave is if you have or if you know anybody that has fever of more than four days, it could be a Delta-Omicron combination or a Delta and not Omicron. So don't take it lightly. And secondly, there is still a possibility that amongst all this Omicron, you might still get the Delta virus. And if that happens, you might still end up in the hospital. So please don't take it easy and please don't attend COVID parties. So from flitting from here, 
let's fly over to now to uh, to the us and which is the most affected country at present uh, uh, the, the uh, somebody is asking what about the cocktails that is the monoclonal antibodies is the cocktail that we are talking about and at present it is only helping in people that have fever for more than 4 days or as dr baird maintain has so many of other comorbidities and it is only for the doctors to decide who will require it so uh, coming across to you dr ashish what's the situation like in the us and uh, as us indians and we have lot of parents who have students there uh, is it safe in the us or are people dying on the streets uh, do you have like ganga with bodies floating around in it in the us or uh, is it just like a press uh, overblow of situation in america so can you please tell us and can you please also tell us a little bit about pfizer and moderna versus the vaccines we have avail available here you have a quick 5 minutes ashish morning everyone and uh, wonderful 5 uh, minutes from prateet and uh, deepak now real quick just to come to the point omicron is highly infectious compared to the previous variants but it is not as deadly as uh, prateet and deepak mentioned it mainly affects the upper respiratory tract and for the most part it spares the lungs and hence you don't see that many hospital admissions you don't see those dire images of people just dropping like flies in the hallways and all those deadly images that we've seen in the last year or so coming to your question about is this you know more uh, that is what i gathered is it more how, politicized how the, or how is it how is the situation in america How's the Sorry? situation uh -huh. in the US? Right. So people kind of sort of have come into this mind frame that we've got to learn to live with this now. This is not going anywhere. This is not a finite uh, problem. And this is most likely going to become like the flu. It's going to become endemic. And in fact, uh, Thursday was when I think uh, the government of Spain finally declared it as an endemic and they pretty much told the people that learn to live with this thing it's not going anywhere now when you say learn to live with this i mean are we talking about uh, let's let's pull off the mask and let's uh, no. let's now give up all our uh, precautions and live normally just the way we used to or what does learning no. to live with this mean so in fact what they've said is uh, forget pulling off the mask they've said upgrade your mask so here in the us especially in the smaller towns people were very used to wearing these cloth masks from home and or maximum they'll wear a surgical mask and in fact uh, now the latest guidelines are coming up saying that you need to upgrade it to an n95 and if not an n95 at least a surgical mask but definitely not the homemade single layer cloth mask because that is not doing anything because of the infectivity of this uh, virus the omicron and how's how's life there is is like is our restaurants open movie theaters open malls open yes yes People everything is open in fact uh, i'll just tell you about us after two and a half years for the first time we took vacation we went to hawaii over the holidays and guess what we came back with omicron all of us and uh, we were five families and four families tested positive and wow. in fact i just finished my quarantine on wednesday and thursday was my first day back to work and wow. so personal experience it is upper respiratory tract just nasal congestion runny nose body aches and some headaches and that's pretty much it no lower respiratory symptoms no shortness of breath pulse ox so, doesn't drop so, so that was that was the good part of it the bad part of it was had to sit inside for 10 days and as soon as i finish my quarantine and go back to work on thursday there is a system wide email that now we've lowered it to 5 days <laughs> and seriously you know, <laughs> so anyway uh as far my, as uh, my, my treatment next, goes 
my next uh, question to you is sorry go ahead so my next question to you is this a are there any new magic treatments uh, for the people who get serious with omicron a and b uh, are there any new vaccines which will take care of covid permanently which is coming out in the us or are we going to keep popping vaccines every 6 months okay so to answer your first question as far as treatment goes you know the initial uh, monoclonal antibody concoctions that they had and i'm actually looking at my notes here so so there was the bemlenivab and uh, este uh, etesivimab that combination and the second one was the casirivimab and the uh, imdimivab that combination so both these combinations are found to be very less effective against the omicron and it is to the point where here they don't even use those uh, monoclonal antibodies anymore because the predominant vari- variant is the omicron and so now we pretty much use the sotrovimab and sotrovimab is in such uh, limited uh, has such limited availability that uh, it is highly regulated by the state i mean it is to the point if i were to give it to my family member i would have so much difficulty getting it and it's a single dose it's uh, 500 mg it's given as an iv infusion and it works it works very well for uh, omicron then regarding the oral agents there are two there is the paxlovid that's made by pfizer and there is the molnu molnu pirivir pirivir and that is not as effective so paxlovid has about an 88% efficacy whereas uh, the other one has just about a 30% efficacy 30. and so clearly the cdc guidelines says that you do not use uh molnu uh, molnu pirivir as a first line agent you only use it if uh, paxlovid is not available and the patient needs to understand that it's only going to be 30% efficacious so but they are there they are all there they all have so, very so rigid a take home, inclusion a take criteria a message on a take home message on that is against omicron there is no monoclonal antibodies currently available in india uh the one that is available in the us is very very limited and the oral medications have very little limited effects so we should use use these medications in very very limited forms and only with doctor uh proper god doctor guidance now my next question to you is ashish is you know we are all taking vaccines now we are taking a precaution dose in india uh should we uh, mix and match uh, the vaccines number one um uh, and uh, number 2 is let's assume i have taken my two vaccines and then i've got omicron so should i still go ahead and take a precaution dose you know and how many are we going to pop into our body because clearly it has been shown clearly it has been shown that the two vaccines that we took earlier don't prevent the omicron so uh, where are we going with these vaccines i mean there's a complete confused picture in the whole world on the vaccine a quick one minute and then i'm going to transfer to the next speaker so yes you're right that uh, where is this all going to end i mean if i had the answer probably i would be able to retire tomorrow morning <laughs> uh clearly pfizer is less effective against omicron compared to moderna and when i say pfizer versus moderna i'm talking all three doses and uh, preliminary data have shown that the three doses of moderna is more effective against omicron compared to pfizer and in fact pfizer just announced last week that they are coming out with the fourth dose in april and that will be effective against omicron so if that answers your question this, this is this is a bit like those rocky movies which is a see first you know rocky 1 rocky 2 rocky 3 rocky yes. 4 rocky 5 and then i think in in probably in 2020 on rocky 21 so i guess we'll keep popping vaccines till we doctor are, uh, dr sunil i'll just come to it i think dr ashish has eluded excellently he's given us all the great points but let's stick to the rule of the land and the rule of the government of india is that if you've taken two vaccines of a particular type 
And if you're eligible for a third dose, so-called the precautionary dose, we may call it the booster dose, then you must take it of the same type. So in India, you're not allowed to cross match. Number two, the government of India and the Ministry of Health also clearly states that if you've had a recent COVID-19 infection, you may delay taking your third dose or the second dose if it comes to by three months. That's Super. the rule of the government of India. Yeah. Super, and that makes sense because I guess if you've already had the Omicron, then you can wait for the next uh, vaccine, which may now cover all the COVID uh, variants which are available. Okay, coming down to Australia. Hello, hi. Uh, oh, uh, Dr. Sorry, one thing. One, one quick thing. Yes. You know, you'd asked a question to Deepak earlier that if I have already been infected with Omicron, can I just be Superman and get rid of my mask and everything? Right. There was a study published uh, three days ago that said there is a lot of reinfections with Omicron. Okay. So no, do not be Superman. Even if okay. you've had infection, you can be reinfected. And it's okay. coming back to the same point the number of mutations this virus has. And so, yes, the chances of you being reinfected is quite high, especially with the okay. Omicron. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, can we go quickly now to uh, Dr. Ali? Dr. Ali, can you give us an overview of what things are like uh, in, uh, uh, in, uh, in, in, in Australia? I am going to try and share my, I have some slides, so I'd like to, you know, share some slides. Tartik, can you uh, help him with the share the uh, share screen, please? Can anybody see my screen? Uh, we can't, Dr. Uh, Ali, but uh, your sharing is enabled, so you can go ahead and share. Um, just give me one second. Um, now... Um, Dr. Sunil, we can take some questions by the time it comes up. Yeah, quickly. I'll give me Actually, one second. I'm just posting these. Sure. Uh, sure, sure. Can you see my screen or you still can't? No, we can't. Can't, we can't even see your video. Okay, just okay, a second. Can. So can we, while, while you're doing this, can we flit over to UK and uh, get an overview of UK? And then yeah, I think that might be better. Yes, please. Okay. Yes. Uh, so Dr. Podar, can you take over, please? Uh, How is the situation like in UK? And from all the things that we've heard, what is different uh, in your course of management in the UK? And uh, uh, any, because you have always been ahead of India, three months ahead. Uh, what is the situation? Because we expect something which we will follow uh, as soon as, you know, your wave ends. Yeah, we, we bear the brunt and then you get all the pleasure of <laughs> I'm getting. Well, I mean, first of all, it's a very tough act to follow after all these lovely and great speakers who have given you know, such information, especially from Mumbai. It is absolutely fantastic, you know. And they have actually, you know, got right on the tab saying what is happening currently, which is very important. Before I actually start on with the professional talk, first of all, I'm an oncoplastic reconstructive breast surgeon. I have no clue about COVID and how to treat it. So now why Sunil has chosen me, I'll tell you why. I know Sunil from the age of three, his mom and me, we were classmates. And in one of the birthday parties, which they used to have a lavish birthday parties uh, when he was two or three years of age, I brought him a gun. And till the time he went to the medical <laughs> college, he always thought that I was a policeman. <laughs> he still believes it. So he's always scared of me. He said, oh, policeman has come, policeman has come. Anyway, now coming back to what we're talking about today, what I'm going to do quickly in three minutes, I'm going to tell you the facts and figures in UK as compared to the rest of the world, India and uh, parts of Europe, and then how our life in UK has been affected. So this is this week's uh, statistics that is ending up yesterday, okay? UK statistics are that total number of cases affected so far is 14.9 million cases. Death so far has been 1, 151,000 cases. So there are nearly you know, 151,000 who are dead and they are on the increase. Now, the total number of people who are vaccinated in UK, fully vaccinated is 70%. Partly vaccinated 66.2%, making 76.2%. And this is for all the population age 12 and above. The booster dose uptake is 
35 million people, that is 62.5%. Approximate uh, rates of admission as of this week is 15,500 per week. And this has increased due to Omicron and also laxity during the uh, Christmas holidays. Now, compared to this, in Switzerland, fully vaccinated people 67%, partly 2%, total 69%. In India, I believe as of today, fully vax is 46%, partly vax is 18%, total 64%. And as compared to that, the whole world, 50%, 5-0, fully vaccinated, partly vaccinated, 8.9, 59% of people are vaccinated as of today in the whole world. And in the whole world, the number of cases affected is 317 million and 5.51 million are dead. Now, how does it affect our life in UK? First of all, free vaccination and boosters are offered to thousands of locations in, including supermarket, gyms, and open playground in UK, which is excellent. Nightingale hospitals with full facilities are open for 1,000 patients um, on open grounds or on uh, playgrounds or even on football pitches. And uh, so far, the NHS is not open and we can still control the admission there so that the Nightingale hospitals have not been actually active for the last couple of weeks. Work from home is strongly advocated by, by Boris Johnson and all the offices are working to the uh, capacity of only 25%. Face marks are compulsory on all indoor venues. Certain events and sports, it is mandatory that you should show a proof of double vaccination and a negative test 48 hours before you go for the event. Travel from UK. Now, RT-PCR uh, test requires 72 hours before you travel out of UK, but when you come back, there are no tests required. If you're down with COVID symptoms, you have to self-isolate for 10 days. On day six and day seven, you can uh, test yourself. If you're negative, then you can obviously go out, but obviously with the mask. And if you're fully isolated, uh, vaccinated, there's no need for isolation. And uh, many times you'll find that COVID pass, which is there on our mobile apps, is required uh, whenever you go to certain events. They can question you anywhere, any event, so you have to be prepared. And that's it. That's my talk. Thank you. So my question is, uh, is any anything different being done as far as treatment protocols are concerned in the UK as opposed to what you've heard today uh, no. in Mumbai? No. In Mumbai. So, I, I agree so, with so, Deepak. Yeah. So there is no magic pill anywhere in the world at present? No. Well, Oxford is coming out with a pill uh, which should be operational from the month of March whereby this pill will avoid serious complication and people who have COVID, they can give it to them and they'll reduce the rate of admissions and the symptoms. Uh, that pill has now been passed by the UK government and that will start uh, getting rolled out. Okay, wonderful. I, I don't thank know you. the name. I don't know the name yet, but you know, that's what's going to happen. Thank you, Uncle, for the lovely overview. Uh, Dr. Ali, are we ready with uh, your UK, yes, yes. Uh, with, the, with the Sydney? Yes, I, so I quick am. Thing yes. Because then we need to take questions quickly and I know... This yes, audience is my dying now. Yeah, yeah. So now, a couple of are questions. Are you able to see that... my screen? Yes, now we are about to, we can see your screen. Okay, so just ignore the first few slides. Um, I'm that, just, looks, uh... that looks very complex. We, even if we didn't want to, we would have to ignore it. Fair enough, fair enough. So, um, you know, this is just a little bit of a view, uh, an overview. We have just crossed 1 million cases. That's, you know, 10 lakhs. And... Um, our vaccination rate across Australia is around 85% and 95.1% uh, for the state of New South Wales. Now, New South Wales is the most popular state in Australia. So 95% is, is very good. Um, and it's also, you know, a democratic nation. We don't have any enforcing of anyone to take the vaccine. So 95.1% is really overwhelmingly positive. Now, majority of the patients here are Omicron. Uh, we have probably less than 10% exposure to Delta, but primarily it's Omicron. And uh, we were very fortunate also that um, we did not experience um, you know, other waves due to the very strict border policies. I mean, you know, Australia, was, Australia closed uh, its, its borders for like two years. Um, so um, now, you know, of course, there are 32 mutations in the S1 protein with Omicron. 
but it's interestingly important to also know that uh, this COVID virus, right from the start, in uh, from you know from December 2019 or Jan 2020, have had over 12,000 mutations, and you know of course there's no question in my mind. I don't think uh, that this new variants will continue, but um, usually speaking, with such viruses like you know the uh, you know RNA viruses, um, they 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 are likely to get more and more milder. And that's basically so again, again, of. Ali, I'm, Dr. Ali, I'm going to interrupt you to, into this very, very important statement that you just made. And because you have an in-depth knowledge on viruses, uh, you believe that this is how the viruses normally behave in these waves, that uh, they get the severity gradually reduces. Is that is that right? Because that will be important for the other physicians also here. Well, you know, yes, we have seen that. We have, we have, we have seen that with Omicron. Uh, it has the most number of mutations uh, in the S1 uh, of the of you know S1 protein. So um, yeah, there's no question. But sometimes you know we don't know how the future. Um, you know nobody has actually done the sequencing of this virus, um, and so it is then become it becomes very difficult to know uh, you know what the variants may be. But generally speaking, with uh, you know RNA viruses of this kind. Uh, the probability is that, yes, uh, it's going to become more and more uh, milder. And we're clearly seeing that with this with Omicron. So, so, so that's yeah. the first good news we've had in this whole meeting so far. That, uh, that there, is a, there is a possibility that the virus is now basically gradually becoming milder. And it may, with herd immunity, reduce uh, the impact it has on the world. Of course, there may be more variants which may come. But yes. gradually, we might see lesser and lesser massive affection of the world as opposed to now. It may not be over, but things may look better. Am I right? Can I say that? Yes, you can definitely say that. And, you know, look, um, uh, I think Dr. Prateek initially mentioned about, uh, you know, the virus, uh, the Omicron virus coming from Botswana. Now, um, you know, um, the yes, so the sequencing was done in South Africa. But the virus actually came from Northern Africa. Now, I, I refer Northern Africa over here is because the, apart from South Africa, the whole of the African continent, you have like 1.2% of the population that is immunized against this virus. So you have a lot of mutations coming from Africa. And uh, you know once Africa gets those mutations, then the whole world is going to get those mutations because we live in a very global society now. So. Um, Sorry, uh, so it's important to sort of, you know, uh, be socially responsible here and ensure that the vaccination is far and is, is equitable to all the parts of the world, including, you know, Africa and poorer countries as well, which has not been the case. And so, you know, we have seen this Omicron virus rise. Um, yeah. Okay, so th that's wonderful. Uh, the, the, the the point is, I don't think it's in anyone's hand to kind of hand over vaccines to Africa, but we can expect probably the next variant to re-come from there. But wouldn't it also mean that if Omicron has spread so fast into Africa, wouldn't they start getting herd immunity? And this is God's way of kind of uh, uh, equitizing the fact that there are no vaccines there with uh, a, a great round of infection, just the way we had in the first wave in India. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. So herd immunity is possible, but, you know, you have newer variants with newer mut mutations. So the antibodies that you're talking about, that you get from vaccines, that you get from, um, you know, uh, these different variances are very different. So you need, you have to have newer antibodies. So these variants are going to keep on changing. So when you look at herd immunity, um, you know, I mean, it's, it, uh, how do you have herd immunity against new variants? You see, you will have immunity. Uh, so your body will sort of, you know, adapt better to these, uh, to these variants. But when you talk about herd immunity, you're looking at large population uh, being infected with the same virus. So, um, um, yeah, I mean, you know, moving forward, it is possible for herd immunity, but uh, there are going to be newer variants. And with newer variants, you'll require newer antibodies and you know, one thing that I want to add uh, from uh, Dr. Baird and Dr. Pratik's uh, conversation here is that the mRNA vaccines, such as you know, the Pfizer 
uh, vaccines such as the Moderna vaccine uh, are very, very capable and adaptable to uh, you know, making new uh, boosters that are suitable for such uh, you know, new variants. And so Moderna and Pfizer both have actually got you know, the booster shots coming, which will have very high protection against this Omicron virus. Currently, I think it's in the 30%. But uh, you know, when you look at um, when you look at you know the booster that is coming from both Pfizer and from Moderna, uh, you know you're going to get high 80 percent, if not 90, and that is very possible with the mRNA vaccines, um, with the you know AstraZeneca vaccine, and with the you know uh, Covaxin available in India. Uh, the the there are limitations. Okay, so that that is great to know to to hear. Uh, I have a, uh, uh, Dr. Ali, can we now hold on a few questions and let's take a few questions from the audience and then come back to you again? Of course, because yes, uh, we're no running a little short of Indeed. time. So yes, my, no, no, my, first, yes. my, my first question to all the, uh, all the panelists here and quickly answer there, quickly answer it without going into big explanations. Uh, are we seeing, are we seeing in your opinion, uh, end of the pandemic, which is the, which is the, the pertinent question here, and I think 100 people have logged on to, um, to probably ask that same question. So are we seeing the end of the pandemic here? We can start in the same order. Dr. Pratit, what, uh, what's your opinion? So my take, as I said in my first two minutes, this may be the end of the pandemic, but I think it's shifting to endemic. This disease is here to stay. This date of the disease to expire is infinity. Dr. Deepak? I agree with uh, Dr. Prateen, and I think we should follow the South African model and see what's happening there. And uh, unless there's a different mutation coming up again, I think this should go into an endemic and the pandemic should be uh, well over with. Dr. Ashish? I agree absolutely that I feel the virus is losing its virulence and uh, hopefully, and uh, we are ending and we are ending the pandemic stage and we are entering the endemic stage. You guys know that you're getting recorded, right? <laughs> 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 Dr. Ali, uh, Dr. Ali, can I get your opinion on this? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I totally agree. I think, uh, you know, uh, we are getting into an endemic <laughs> state and probably by 2024. And that's basically what the reason I say 2024 is because, um, you know, there's a lot of investment with pharmaceutical companies and the pharmaceutical companies have invested heavily into vaccines till 2024 because that's when they believe that uh, the virus is probably going to be endemic across. That is brilliant. That's that's a brilliant analysis, Dr. Ali. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Yes. Podar, uh, your opinion? Yes, absolutely. It is uh, reaching the endemic stage here. People are lax. Government has not put any further lockdowns despite uh, Boris Johnson who may lose his uh, you know, prime ministership. And really it is helping. Now people are going out, but yes, face masks, uh, social distancing, and the office is still not open. But I feel that uh, Oxford is going to come out with lots of vaccines, which will have the combination or a combo thing. And just like we have every year in the winter, a flu vaccine, we are going to have a, a COVID vaccine, which will have all these variants from next year. Wonderful. So that's all great news, guys. Uh, so, so now, uh, Dr. Prateet, when we say endemic, uh, am I to believe that either you will get a severe severe uh, flu-like influenza and you can end up in the hospital uh, for some people and in some people just run like a cough and cold? Is that what an endemic situation means? Endemic means it's just like a flu thing, as you said, cough, cold, fever. But please remember, even the common cold or the influenza or flu causes 0.2% deaths and they land up in the ICU. So it's not that if it becomes endemic, you're going to be devoid of serious diseases and illnesses. But of course, that means you're not going to behave and see waves like the Delta waves. Okay. I believe now we have a question from Mr. Sunil Goenka. He's put up his hand. Can, uh, can you, you can ask your question, sir. Unmute yourself and ask the question. Yes, Are you I, there? Yes, I'm very much here. I got a very important question is that what about uh, babies? You know, we have uh, infants at home below one year and we have uh, children below eight years at home. We have five years and eight years. And how far will the parents get affected? Uh, what precautions can the children be taken or are they being affected? That's one question. And I have another question that how far have you seen lately deaths of uh, people who were exercising after COVID? So they're saying that you are not supposed to exercise or do any physical activity after the uh, COVID infection. 
So, of what Omicron or Delta, wherein people have the physical fitness people who like to continue doing, keeping themselves fit, and they have had deaths, uh, a South Indian star, and a lot of people have come across bodybuilders who expired after the COVID being and they're doing exercises. That's the two questions. Uh, do, can one of you guys take it, please? Uh, Dr. Yeah. Deepak, Dr. Pratit, anyone? Yeah, I'll, I'll take a both of them, and then uh, the other people can add in. First thing about the children. There was a lot of discussion, should we vaccinate the children or should we not vaccinate children? Because the number of uh, people getting infected may be similar. Or uh, because last week also we had more than lack of children getting infected. But how many deaths occur in children is very negligible. Then why are we vaccinating them? That was a question which was asked and that is the thing which we have been always thinking over. The reason of vaccinating children is because we need to start the school. And if we have to end a pandemic, the number of cases have to drop. That's the reason we need to vaccinate children. One. Second thing, children take the infection home. If they get infected, they take it home. And at home, they have got high-risk children, parents or grandparents who are high-risk. So that is the reason we need to vaccinate. The purpose of vaccination is to reduce or stop the pandemic. And if we have to make it endemic, like for example, the flu virus, we give shots of flu to the children because they are the one who transmit it and cause an endemic or a pandemic. That is the main purpose of vaccination. As far as the second question is concerned, um, Wait a sec, I again forget. What was the second question about? Just give me a hint. It's about uh, the exercising, exercising and sudden death. Yeah. Yeah. See, what we say is post COVID or any disease, any disease for that matter, a person feels lethargic and weak. It has been con uh, postulated that many of the patients post COVID they have increased, like, you know, cardiac arrest or is in fact heart attacks and something has increased. But still, we have not been able to document whether the number are very statistically significant because the number of people who have been vaccinated are in crores and the number of people who have gone into complications are very few compared to statistically significant is the thing which we look for. So those people who want to exercise can exercise. We always tell them restrain for at least a week, 10 days. Because in the initial two, three days, we develop fever. We develop some kind of a response. So at least for one week, 10 days, if it's possible, no. avoid physical activity, avoid too much of exercise, and then you can gradually increase because now you're able to cope up with the vaccination, the effect of the vaccination also. But the vaccination causing death, or vaccination causing heart attack, during your exercise, first check for yourself whether you are predisposed. Do you have a strong family history of heart attack? Then I think you should be careful. Avoid for some time. If you do not have a strong family history, I think you can go ahead and start exercising. I mean, Thank you. The problem you. is that non-symptomatic. But I didn't answer my first answer question. Sorry, sorry to interrupt, but my first question is not re uh, replied well. We've gone to the vaccination part of it. But my issue is, do children get easily, like infants, especially below one year, below two years, or below eight um, years? Do they get? Can I, can I answer that? I can Please. take that answer if you like. Um, yes, yeah. absolutely, absolutely. Kids definitely can get infected with COVID. Um, I have a granddaughter and she was infected with COVID, um, but uh, the symptoms are, you know, generally, I mean, the, the patient usually is asymptomatic. Um, okay. Here in Australia, we've started vaccination from five years onwards. So, um, you know, everybody, so in, in order for schools to reopen, I think, you know, the government is making a, a decision to vaccinate, you know, kids five years and older. Um, but yes, I mean, you know, if you look at the early data, not just with uh, Omicron, but even with the, the beta, the alpha, the kappa, and the other variants, the, um, the mortality rate from uh, zero to 10 years was very, very small. I, I think, you know, there was, um, I mean, uh, if, the, yeah, there was very tiny. I think the peop uh, there was a couple of cases who succumbed, but uh, that was primarily due to, you know, being severely immunocompromised. So yes, so, kids can get it, but they're going to be by and large asymptomatic. So not to not to worry, the worry factor comes from children transmitting to more people, and uh, the pandemic will not end if uh, we allow it to run wild. Uh, any other questions, uh, friends? Uh, <coughs> you can unmute yourself thing. and ask, please. Yeah. Suni, I just add one thing before I forget. You don't need to test after your isolation period is over because we all of us many times invariably land up testing. We should not test. Okay. I mean, you know, I mean, you know, with, with that, what I'm going to say is that, you know, with the, we, we live in different jurisdictions. Here in Australia, we have to, 
uh, prior to breaking our isolation. So I think, you know, in India, maybe that may be relevant, but uh, overseas and other jurisdictions, you know, the government requirements are quite different. And I'm so sure some, Dr. Deepak can appreciate that. So, so some of the messages I'm getting from this is, number one, the virus may be getting milder. Uh, but we still cannot take off our guards at present and uh, start uh, running around. Uh, the Omicron is a milder version. However, if you have more than four days of fever, you have to have to immediately approach your doctor, which is very important, and monitor your oxygen saturation rate. Uh, the next thing is that the monoclonal antibody should be given only under very specific conditions where we may have a combination of Delta and Omicron which only the doctors can decide. Uh, children can get infected, but usually it is mild in that. Uh, we must vaccinate and take the third dose. If you have had the Omicron currently, then wait for three months before you take the next dose. So now my next question is, guys and lovely, lovely speakers, when does the world see the end of this situation? When can we travel normally? remove our mask and be normal again. In your personal opinions, I know it's a toughie, but again, we'll go with the same uh, speakers. We'll start with Dr. Prateet first. Dr. Prateet, when do you see the world traveling and becoming normal again? See, uh, you know, we had a phase between the second wave and the third wave where things were normalizing. So I think as we get future variants, the space between two variants will be larger. We'll be able to travel more and more. And as the world realizes that this is turning into an endemic flu-like diseases, things should open up. I think next four to six months, you should see a completely different world in terms of travel restrictions, lockdowns, et cetera, et cetera. Best news I've heard all day. <laughs> I'm sending you that box of sweets right away. <laughs> Dr. Deepak, what is your opinion? See, if as far as today's uh, situation is concerned, we can remove the mask as mask as, as soon as the politicians decide. If the politicians <laughs> have the guts to say, we are in the same situation as UK or Spain or anyone says that, that now remove your mask and forget about the rest, then I think we can remove it tomorrow. But the crux is we should be willing to get infected. And if the resources, I mean, the people who are at high risk definitely should not. But we can definitely do it Whenever the now in today's situation I'm talking about, when Omicron is there, we can definitely remove it as soon as possible. Dr. Ashish? Now Are that you you've scared me that it's all being recorded, <laughs> <laughs> I feel masking is here to stay. I think <laughs> it's going to be the new normal in some shape or form. I mean, there will be phases when all of a sudden cases are so low that people feel, oh, nothing is going on and everyone's going to be roaming around without masks. And then all of a sudden there'll be a new variant that pops up, cases go up, everyone puts his masks on again. So in some shape or form, masking is here to stay. At when, least does the world, the when does the world normalize, Ashish? I don't know what normalcy is, but I think it'll be at least another couple of years. So probably, uh, as Ali, Ali said, 2024. Ali. It's, yeah, I, I, it's I, a I capitalist think, economy. I mean, you know, so if the Dr. pharmaceutical Ali. companies have invested until 2024, they'll make sure we suffer until 2024. <laughs> um, look, Dr. I, I Ali? Think, yeah, so, you know, if Australia is open now um, to the world, I mean, I think, uh, you know, th this is the new norm. And uh, this is going to sort of, you know, get better and better. Um, we're going to be uh, more and more, um, you know, to the new norm. I think um, um, so. I guess you know by probably 2024 it will be endemic, um, according to you know what the pharmaceutical companies are doing. Uh, however, uh, yeah, I mean you know this is kind of the new norm. Okay, and uh, Dr. Podar, last words. Okay. Um... UK has been the leader in the last two years regarding the COVID situation. The first vaccination was given to a lady when I was working in the same hospital in Coventry General Hospital. And she was a 92-year-old lady who's uh, who she's, uh, much better now and she's still alive. She's 94. Number two, COVID and the coronavirus uh, lingers in dark places and in cold uh, countries or in winter uh, time. The chief medical officer from the UK has said that let this winter pass away. We will assess it, say, in the month of April when it's springtime 
see what is the damage done in this current wave. And if things are not so bad, the hospital admission is not increased, people are not dying, then UK will certainly open up, which it has already opened up now. We don't need to have any tests coming back to UK and RT-PCR will go and they'd probably do a lateral test. So I feel that come this autumn, things will get better uh, as far as UK and Europe is concerned and then probably the whole world will follow. That wonderful news, guys. So that is the news which everybody was uh, willing, to, wanting to hear today. And that's happy news for most of us. Please be careful for the next, uh, next couple of months. And uh, I think we should get through this pandemic, all of us together. Uh, and I want to thank all the six speakers for wonderful. And thank you for being a couple. Ashish had to wake up at 5.30 in the morning. Somebody woke up very late in the night, Ali. And uh, thank you, everybody, for being here, taking out your time and giving us so much information. And it's been a great, great uh, uh, talk. And for the first time in two years, we are not sitting here and warning people that you might die. And uh, hopefully all of us will be off and healthy. And uh, thank you, everybody, for being here today. And uh, let's give them a big hand, guys. Let's give them a big show of hands, guys. So thank you to all the speakers for a wonderful thing. And with this, I end this. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very kindly. Thank you, Dr. Samil. Thank you, everyone here. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. <laughs>